All right, recording started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the IPFS Hollands October 9th. Um, it has been um, a couple of weeks since we had the last Hollands, so looking forward to hear everyone's updates and like what everyone is working on. Uh, as always, we have the agenda. Um, please do add items to the agenda if you want to bring them up to the call, throughout the call. And the note, the ter- not, not ter- note taker for today is David Grisham. Thank you, David, for volunteering. Cool. So let's get started. Um, the first item is actually a demo. Um, Johnny, do you want like, to share the update that you're just sharing so that it gets recorded and distributed, broadcasted to the whole community? You're muted now. You might have to unmute yourself in Zoom. Okay, hang on just a second. So I guess today was supposed to be our roadmap. I guess there's no roadmap uh, call today. We we will have, yeah, thank you for asking. Um, I kind of like mentioned that on the issue. So essentially like, most of the people that typically attend this call are traveling. So it's really hard for them to attend the uh, like traveling like literally inside a plane so it's hard for them to be here and like be discussing roadmap we want to have that call out as soon as possible and we are shooting for next week uh we will definitely make sure that like it gets communicated through the issue and that we have the chance to discuss, discuss the roadmap of ipfs with the whole community today is still like a light version of the call So, uh, if you like a little bit more time to prepare, we can also like do just like a round of like updates. People just sharing what they've been working on the last couple of weeks. Okay, you're ready. We can do that out there. Thank you. All right. Which screen do you guys see? Uh, right now, it just says I started screen sharing. I don't see. Oh, um, now I see slides. All right, decentralized vaccination registry. Yeah, exactly. All right, so what I did was, um, I'm a physician, and so the use cases really is for uh, using DIDs for uh, credentialing of physicians, as well as verifiable claims of vaccinations. One of the best examples of that is uh, after the hurricane actually came through Florida, there was a massive refugees of, of people fle- fleeing the hurricane to Tennessee. The, state, the governor of Tennessee um, had a, an executive order, number 66, that suspended the practice, uh, the laws that surrounded the practice of medicine. So that allowed for any physician in any state to take care of any patient as long as they were a refugee of their hurricane. So that the, was the use case. I tried to actually using, using, like I mentioned, uh, Project Indy, which is uh, Hyperledger's uh, identity management and member services. And looking at the code, it was just filled with uh, the, the skulls of bad, um, uh, poor security practices. And ultimately, I did install it, and, but it was just fluff. It actually was like a command line, Alice and Bob, and actually didn't have any sort of robustness. So I decided to build my own. Um, the use case here is really um, using a decentralized public key infrastructure in order to get the public um, keys of the patient and the provider in order to create a peer-to-peer protocol uh, so that the physician can uh, uh, document vaccination records into their EHR and the patient gets the vaccination, but the patient is able to get a verifiable claim that they actually got that vaccination. In this case, they're, if they're a refugee fleeing a hurricane, they don't have their, their yellow card of all their vaccinations, they want the place to store it, and that could be on a phone or IPFS or any other sort of uh, uh, repository. So the syntax for the DID spec, um, decentralized identities, was actually came out of one of the rebooting the Web of Trust meetings back uh, last year. And I think actually Juan was there and actually, but I think uh, Vitalik and Drummond Reed actually penned the, 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 the specification. And here it's basically, it's a variation of the URN method spec, uh, uh, uniform resource name, uh, which is a published IANA uh, protocol. 
uh, instead of, uh, for instance, this could be URN uh, ISBN, but in this case, it's uh, DID uh, Sovereign as being the method. Um, this is what they published using the Sovereign Trust Framework with a met method-specific identifier, which is the first half of the ED25519 verification public key um, using elliptic curve cry cryptography. Um, but instead, I actually used um, a, oops, back up. I call it IPID for interplanetary identifiers. And in this case, it actually goes to the IPNS hash because it being a permissioned public distributed hash table that I, my node, actually has access to. And um, so it resolves uh, to an IPNS uh, resource, um, but I'm able to update that as a mutable uh, pointer uh, with a cryptographic um, resolver. So the basic presentation, let's see. Yeah, my computer's trying to do too much now. Any reason to like call it IPID and not just IPNS? Um, I think it's just, um, I wanted to, it, it's, a, it's a method on top of IPNS. And so I think, uh, and, I, and I, this is, I think we're just for, I, I need some feedback. If this is going to be uh, a good use of IPNS for one node, because it really is just serving up one DDO. Maybe it's, that's it. The, the, and so IPNS is really, so it's, uh, could be used for serving up a lot more than just one um, JSON document. And so I think it's, this could be like a, a specific file within the IPNS uh, file tree, but this is just the way I implemented it. Got so it. here's an example of the on the physician side um, with just this. Here's the City of Hope. Um, let me just refresh both of these. And the idea is that once you actually have the the public keys, I actually created a, a pub sub room. Uh, that actually uses a concatenation of each of the public keys in order to create the web RTC communication. And once you actually have that, I guess it's actually technically pub flood actually reading the documentation. So it really still needs to be a specific peer to peer communication channel. But I was just using um, the pub sub room that Hector created. And, uh, uh, and it's stalling. Johnny, can bad, you say one more time demo. what DID stands for? Uh, decentralized identifiers. Cool. And in the sovereign framework, they actually, they're going to have an entire blockchain. There's also uh, also one by uh, Manu Spoonie, which is uh, Varus One. That's through Digital Bazaar. Uh, so we actually at the, at the rebooting the Web of Trust conference, we actually had a whole bunch of uh, different. Uh, ways of resolving either over sovereign and ultimately it re it's a namespace resolution and i think that's i think the next thing which is that it, you basically need to register this method spec and figure out how to resolve it so my computer seems to not like doing all of this at the same time there we go all right it's coming up But basically, it creates a room. The, the room is a, is a pub sub room. Once you actually have that channel of communication, there's a, just a messaging good back and forth that says, hey, um, what, I'm, I'm a requesting verifiable claims. Do you have any verifiable claims? And which is all just the code that I stole from the Project Indy. Of just a, and that's, I think, that the next step is that once we resolve the DDO, then it's a matter of like showing the verifiable claim um, and and using it and verifying it, verifying the signatures using the public key. I'm going to skip the demo. <laughs> can Can you point us to where uh, to learn more about Project Indy? Uh, not sure if I'm familiar with it. Can you hear me? Did I lost my connection? Hang on. I 
think your connection is lagging, Johnny. Not, I cannot hear you anymore. Could someone else confirm if you could hear, if you can hear Johnny or not? I can't. I also yeah. can't. All right, it seems we, we lost Johnny. Let's see if he can, comes back. And here he is. Try again. <laughs> okay, we can hear you now. All right, strange. Would you like to try again? Like go back to the presentation? Yeah. All right, so this is an example of the DDO. Um, it uses JSON LD as the context, and the, uh, the D -D DID on IPID resolves to a particular hash. And then this is where actually the public key infrastructure des describes the owner of the key. Um, in this case, this is a, a elliptic curve uh, uh, public key when Johnny? it expires. Just, just um, before, like you were sharing, I think just the browser, and so we could see the entire capture of the browser. Right now, I think you are sharing the entire screen, and so like for everyone that has like a screen of a smaller resolution than yours, uh, we cannot see the entire snippet of code that you're showing on the slide. Uh, all right. If you could just share the browser, that would help everyone follow your your own thoughts. The better. Um, it's a bit better. Uh, you still need to scroll. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, right. I think I, can see I didn't you. like the, the whole my three monitor setup. I think. Oh my! That's a pro setup. <laughs> So here's an example. Uh, so after you resolve the DID to a specific DDO, it actually here's the content, which is just I, I did JSON. Actually, it should be probably um, IPLD that basically describes the public key infrastructure. Here's an example of a verifiable claim about a specific DID. In this case, the proof of vaccination credential with the claim being a specific vaccination code. This example is just a flu shot. And then I also did a smart contract, just a, this, a simple proof of existence contract for the vaccination. And it has a signature that actually can validate the signature and who that signature is about. And then here's a proof of license credential, uh, credential that proves the physician is licensed. And in this case, I just made it up. This is where actually I'm on the W3 task force for verifiable claims. We're actually working out the attributes of describing how do you, the robustness of the, of the attributes to describe a licensing credentials. So I think, uh, I, th I think this is a, a better solution to the whole decentralized public key infrastructure that is truly self-sovereign that I own. It doesn't require a blockchain, uh, I think, to resolve that. I think it's certainly steps are messaging of how do you actually pass the verifiable claims back and forth and then um, uh, uh, how do you update them how do you sa uh, save them and I presented at the re rebooting the web of the trust so I'll be in um, the uh, IIW next week talking about it more and getting some more feedback this is awesome Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Actually, like, I was literally talking with another group like an hour ago about the IDs and like their experience at the same hackathon. And they are working on like fake news. And so they are trying to develop like a language for fake claims. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like you have here like a great head start. Uh, 
when we say that like an identity is completely self-sovereign, um, how can like uh, the responsibility for a certain identity be transferred um, between two organizations? Imagine like if I have something on Ethereum that validates my identity, validates like who governs um, a record, how can I transfer that out of Ethereum and to another like blockchain or even just like to a centralized service um, like an um, anniversary or, uh, or a government institution? Is there, is there any way to do that or? Yeah. So ultimately it's about key management and it requires that central authority to actually to, to post a public key and use a, a service that resolves that basically that you can validate, let's say uh, the state of Tennessee for physician licensing, um, or it could be I'm on the ABMS American Board of Medical Specialty. It requires them to actually to have public key infrastructure to actually design things. And so it's one thing, the, the web of trust of like, Maybe you guys see my my credentials and say, "Yeah, you're licensed." That is, so I get a hundred people to say that doesn't mean I'm licensed. I just got a hundred people to, to say it. So it really still requires a central authority that actually like it's basically within the the infrastructure in order to authenticate it. So I, I, so and then I think that's the first step is just is to get central authorities to use decentralized infrastructure in order to do it, which is basically what they do now. Which is SSL is a form of decentralized um, public key infrastructure, but it requires them to actually use this new model of, of maintaining keys and rotating keys. The next thing is actually is the resolving of the verifiable claims um, in a way that is um, resolvable across different methods. And that means like, all right, so I, I used IPID, but then you can get it, my verifiable claims on IPFS or, or I see that you're using Sovereign or uh, Veris or B uh, BTRTK for Bitcoin uh, that I was talked about. So there's a way of actually resolving across blockchains that, um, that actually you can get those verifiable claims and verify the signatures. Uh, in, and so this is ultimately about um, namespace resolution. So how do you designate a, a flag and say IPID or uh, Veris one, which is going to be V one or ETH for Ethereum. Uh, so we actually also talked about well, who registers ETH for Ethereum, who owns it, and who basically, um, as part of the method spec, specifies how you resolve the the DO and exchange the verifiable claims. Uh, Evernim, who does uh, Sovereign, has actually had an interesting thing. Was they actually basically want to do a zero knowledge proof? You're passing a binary to the prover, the, per the person who owns the identity, and you have basically have to solve a math problem in order to then give it back to them. And once you've actually solved that, then actually it's proof of the verifiable claim. But it's uh, right now on the uh, verifiable claims task force, we're actually still just working on age over 21 as being the, the use case. And that I think is still uh, where we're at. Got it. Thank you. So, okay. Uh, th does anyone else has any questions right now? I see that Jay is posting a bunch of uh, things on the chat. Do you want to bring them up, Jay? <clears throat> sure. I just wanted to point out that I think what Johnny's talking about is a key piece of not only IPFS, but also Filecoin. In fact, it's mentioned as one of the use cases in the Filecoin white paper. If you look on page 33 of the Filecoin white paper under contracts and Filecoin under smart contracts, specifically mentions that a decentralized naming system, asset tracking, and crowd cell platforms, uh, specifically the decentralized naming system, is a one of the key potential use cases for Filecoin. So I'm excited to see what Johnny is creating. And I think it can definitely be generalized beyond the healthcare realm. It's certainly important in the healthcare realm, but this is one of the key areas that I think is right for innovation is in the naming, addressing, numbering, and identity space. That's it. Yep. And I think one of the, uh, it was brilliant, Mark Miller, the famous computer scientist, was actually at the Rebooting Web of Trust, as well as uh, Tim Berners-Lee. So just one, I just had to pause and like, you know, I had an intellectual conversation with Tim Berners-Lee and I was just, wow. 
Although I actually, uh, he's very much HTTP focused. That's what he thinks. That's all. And I think uh, HTTP, of course, being just one one uh, protocol among many in the IPFS stack. So, uh, but yeah, so I think certainly I, I, uh, identities and uh, and I think the other thing is actually smart agents. We actually, we talked about at the meeting was like Alice and Bob, but then there's the idea of having a dummy bot that actually Alice gives to the dummy bot in order to store and actually transfer a asset and delegate that to an agent. So I think it really is, Nick's thing is actually about automation of, uh, of internet of, of things, devices, um, or agents that actually, um, that need to perform some AI function. And that's what we're building here at, uh, at Transindex. Yeah. And if I could add Johnny, I think that the point you're talking about, particularly the smart agents might be a next paradigm for smart contracts or let's say logic that's built into the overall network and system that might actually be superior to the Ethereum approach. So mm -hmm. I think it's really fundamental what you're talking about. Cool. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, like Johnny, if you want like, to drum some links on the notes on like where people can follow more about these. Essentially, you mentioned a project called Indie to do the verifiable claims. Uh, I'm not familiar with that project. If you could like link to it, it'd be great. Yep, sure. At the end of the rebooting the web of trust, we actually were all forced to um, basically it was about pushing out code and specs, and so um, um, so I did. It's here, my GitHub. That I submitted, and then uh, Project India is under Hyperledger. It's a Hyperledger project, and I'll find it. It's under um, Hyperledger GitHub slash Project Indie, and I'll put that in there. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, cool. So let's go back to the agenda. I don't think any new item was added. Um, we still have 30 minutes. Uh, would people would like to go around and just give an update on what they've been working on? Oh, I guess Johnny just shared his update. <laughs> he has been working on a lot of cool stuff. Uh, do others want to do the same? Sounds good. Thank you. Thumbs up. All right, uh, let's try it. Like if, you, if you don't want to share an update, you don't have to. Like, <laughs> uh, I'll just go through using my order, the order I see on the screen. So Jay, that means that you are first. Mind, mind sharing? Yeah. Well, uh, Jason, who's on the call as well from Phoenix, is uh, uh, part of a group here in Phoenix that's working on some naming, addressing, numbering, and identity applications using IPFS. Uh, using the, the JS IPFS and WebRTC, and uh, we've we've um, had a little lull over the last month or so because of some other uh, distractions. But our intention is to work on exactly what Johnny's uh, talking about. And uh, you know, again, I see this as a key area for innovation and something that could also be an, an a, a opportunity to use Filecoin as a storage mechanism in relation to recording of WebRTC video calls and uh, audio and other, so I think there's some really interesting opportunities here. That's it. Jason, you want to add anything? Uh, no, not specifically uh, to that. Jason's done most of the work, most of the development work on um, the prototype that we're working on. Along so with another calling. One, not, I'm sorry to interrupt, but one thing I found out was that the WebRTC is uh, not supported in all browsers. And so it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Like still, still a work in progress in Safari and Edge has it. Uh, well, actually not. Like Safari was supposed to get WebRTC with a new Chrome uh, macOS, 
update. I still need to test it out. Um, but it should work. Yeah, my my answer to that is uh, tough. <laughs> and I think that, uh, you know, the direction is towards uh, WebRTC, not only for video and audio, but also for data. And I think there's some, you know, yes, it's been a long time coming. And yes, the mass adoption isn't there yet. And I think this naming and addressing and numbering is a key missing piece for uh, mass adoption of WebRTC. So uh, whatever browsers don't support it, um, in my view, the, the direction is definitely towards ubiquitous WebRTC capability. And um, if you are interested, there is a conference next June in the UK called ComCon, which is going to be a very small group of participants that are going to be focused on WebRTC application and innovation. So uh, I think it's C-O-M-M-C-O-N.io if you're interested in that. Awesome. Thank you. If you can find the link and post it on the notes. So that kept sure. it's recording. Um, let's go to the next one, Christian. Hi. So I, I've been working on a train to have Sharnes tests for JS IPFS. But uh, one big problem is that uh, uh, Charnes tests for Go IPFS are using a lot of Go programs, a lot of small Go programs, and the um, and the Docker image doesn't have Go. So I don't know what we should do about uh, this. Should we change the image or I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So because thank I you. Want, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Sorry, I thought you. Were, yeah, okay. I don't want to have to find uh, another way to test uh, rather than all the Go, the small Go programs that are used by Sharnes because it's a lot. It would be a lot of work, and uh, I don't think it's worth it because it will make the tests be different between Go IPFS and GS IPFS. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So ideally, thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for picking up that project again. Um, ideally, what we want is not uh, like the tests to be duplicated uh, 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 in both repos, but actually have a repo with all of the sharpness tests and all of the setup, and then like the repo to have the way to like pull the different IPFS implementations and even like versions, like right? like. The sharpness test should not be just run against the latest, but actually against all of the versions, so that we know what are the differences in terms of APIs amongst versions, which is something that we don't do yet. It's kind of like, yeah, when we know there's a change, we change the tests, but like it would be great if we could actually have a, a way to use the sharpness test to tell us when there is a breaking change so that we can update the version accordingly. Uh, we are also getting more implementations of IPFS. We now see that there is a, in the community a C implementation, there is a work in progress Python implementation. And in the mid long term, we probably will see um, a Rust implementation. So it would be useful uh, right now uh, to start preparing the sharpness test to be just like this consumable by all of these implementations so that, yes, we can use Go binaries to do the, the tests. But if that's the case, then those binaries should live in their own repos, be compiled be pulled into the Docker image, and then the Docker image should know how to pull JSIPFS, GoIPFS, Rust IPFS, PyIPFS, and so on. Um, does, it, does it make sense for you, Christian, to, to take this route? Like, any thoughts yeah, on Yeah, but um, yeah, the, the Docker image is the same for the, for the GS tests and the Sharnes tests right, right now, so I, I, I'm not sure if we, so yeah, maybe we, we should uh, have a separate um, Docker image for the different tests. Uh, yeah, that could be a solution, yeah. I, I will is... try to. Yeah, go ahead. But maybe it will make the, um, the con test configuration uh, more complex. So I don't, yeah. But I, w I will take a look at that to see if we can use a different uh, Docker image. Other Sharnes tests. 
We probably can. Um, I would strongly prefer, uh, unless there is like a strong blocker for it, to have all of the sharpness tests, like IPFS slash sharpness in its own GitHub repo with all of the setup. Like it would be great if we could like just point the sharpness test and like test this binary and like you just like run the test again that binary and tell us like what is broken, what doesn't work and so on. Uh, instead of like having the tests embed in all of these repos and which is okay. a lot of code duplicated everywhere. And then like each time we have yeah, yeah, time. Yeah, I understand. Have but I, I first wanted to have them work for JS IPFS so, so that after that I could uh, have a better idea of what should be common Mm -hmm. uh, both Go IPFS and JS IPFS. Well, Rather than trying to do something uh, generic and then fi finding afterwards that it doesn't work uh, for some implementations or something like that. That's why I wanted to have them work for JS IPFS first before uh, putting all the Sharnas tests, tests in their own repo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and I will, go ahead. Sorry, I keep. I, I, yeah, will, I will. If if I first uh, try to have a Docker image for the Sharnas test, then maybe it will be better, uh, like like you suggest, and it will be easier to have all the Sharnas tests in their own repo. So I will I will try things and I will tell you. Mm, okay. The, yeah. Do you want to open an issue uh, on IPFS nodes with like all of these ideas and like the possible paths towards having sharpness tests that only not, do not test that on, not only test the robustness of IPFS but also like check the compliance in terms of API because in the end like the sharpness tests are right now the ones like testing the CLI API and like saying if it conforms with all the other implementations or not. Okay, I will open uh, an issue. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you much. Uh, all right, next one is David. Uh, so I'm, I've been teaching a course and been pretty bogged down with that. And that's sort of been my story for the last couple of months. But, uh, but I'm, I'm working on finishing still up on this a cluster feature, IPFS cluster, uh, to support basic auth for simple authentication. And um, and working on going to do a call with David this week to talk about writing up a bit swap spec, which would be really cool. And also continue to work on uh, bit swap research. And right now I'm very close. I'm in the testing phase of a round robin queue for bit swap for Go IPFS that I wrote. And I, th I just have to make sure that it works and find the bugs and then hopefully integrate it into Go IPFS as an experimental feature. And yeah, and then start doing my, my research on that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'll follow up on the email about sending up the meeting that. Thank you so much for preparing that up. Cool, next up is Wyatt. You yeah, muted, you yeah, muted, you yeah. <laughs> Classic, okay. So, hey everybody, um, not too much to report. I just got back off a plane last night, I'm still kind of tired. I've been mostly focusing on a few issues that are still um, showing up with IPFS cluster specifically uh, with the wrap state when you, when you join a cluster and then people leave and then things are pinned and then people come back. Um, so yeah, and currently I'm yeah, just working on some details there. If anybody's interested further, let me know, but a lot of just little details with that. Um, yeah, that's all. Awesome, thank you. So next up in my screen is Johnny. Johnny, do you have like, any other pitch you'd like to share or you feel good about it? <laughs> No, that's what I'm working on. Is really, I'm heavy into this uh, DID method specs and uh, verifiable claims and ap applications in, in healthcare. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, next up is Jason. Any other things that you want to share, Jason? Um, yeah. Um, so actually, over the course of this past month, um, I was working on the uh, consensus blockchain for social impacts uh, hackathon. Um, and uh, the, the project um, was uh, essentially a decentralized um, marketplace for uh, carbon offset trading. 
And uh, while IPFS was not uh, a key component in that deliverable, um, going forward in the execution strategy, the uh, one of the key things that is needing to be worked out is this uh, um, kind of like IPFS PubSub API implementation where uh, third, par third party auditors can contribute and listen into um, a mesh of IoT devices that communicate um, sub submitting types of uh, you know, CO2 uh, emissions and things like that. Um, and if anybody has any uh, input on how to execute something like that, some kind of decentralized API execution using PubSub or RPC or whatever it is, um, I'd be uh, more than happy to hear about that. And I'll post some information about the hackathon in the chat. Uh, awesome. Yeah, a couple of ideas. Um, so in its most simple form, you should be able just like to subscribe to a topic that everyone else is like publishing to. Like think of it as like a log. Like if everyone, if, if every single IT device is publishing to like this log thing, then you can like know which topic they are publishing, subscribe, you get the events. Uh, of course, like right now, uh, and as Johnny pointed out earlier, the implementation, the underlying implementation of PubSub in IPFS is what we call FloodSub. So it just like, leverages the peer connectivity that IPFS has to a bunch of peers and uses DHT to connect all the peers that are publishing on the topic uh, to get the messages on the topic. It does do some relay, but it preemptively tries to dial to all the peers that are interested on the topic. And so it is not necessarily like, scalable for like millions of nodes. Like in order to be scalable for millions of nodes, which is typically what you get from IoT, you have to have some kind of like spanning tree where nodes are like sharing messages with each other. And then you have like to have strategies to make sure that like no node eclipses the others. And that's something that we are actively researching on. There is a repo on only peer to peer slash research pops up, which has a bunch of papers. And there is people working on that. That being said, again, for prototype use cases and like for trying the API out, you can do this like subscribe um, on a topic that everyone is publishing to and therefore replicating your data. One of the examples that, um, um, was built in the past that used this uh, tool, this technique, was the IIIFDB FDB and the annotations for IIIF documents. Um, it was showed around June this year. Um, uh, I think there is like an outlands that has a demo of Ed and Drew and Pedro showing how that works. And essentially, like you have multiple organizations publishing annotations through PubSub. You see the annotations of the documents, but you want the annotations to persist. So then you have like a couple of other extra nodes that are subscribing on the same topics and just like pinning all of the changes, all of the annotations that were created by the browser nodes. This way, you have like the real time ish way of like everyone sees the latest annotations, but th those nodes can go down and go back up because they can still retrieve the content that was pinned by the nodes that were just there in the network subscribing to the same topics and making sure that those things got stored. Um, and so, so yeah, the, this, I hope. Yeah, I that, 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 yeah that, that's all very helpful. Um, I'll, I'll definitely check out that uh, <coughs> the uh, IPF or, or PubSub research article stuff um, as well. Um, Cause yeah, that, that, that's all exactly kind of what I'm looking for. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I and, mean, if you have any questions or design docs or yeah, just point me at issues or open issues in our repos. Yeah, there's, yeah, absolutely. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Okay, next up is Dimitri. I'm not sure if Dimitri is here because, um, yes, here. okay. Hey, Dimitri. Hey. Wanna chat um, a bit? Sure, uh, so <clears throat> I've been mostly kind of jumping in and, and fixing some of the uh, little issues, specifically uh, progress um, functionality and in JS uh, IPFS API. Uh, I've also uh, started to work on the IPLD uh, Ethereum integration uh, with Herman and, and Kumavis. Uh, I've been picking up some Go, so. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, we finally mapped the uh, storage tree, or try, or however it's pronounced now. <laughs> storage one, create? Uh, a storage tree, the Ethereum storage tree. Okay, got it, the, the yeah. format. Yep, the format. 
Awesome. Uh, we're pretty close to having pretty much all of the uh, all of the Ethereum formats on on mapped on IPLD. In Go as well. In Go, yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. That's cool. Thank you. Awesome. Um, all right. So I think I am the last one. Uh, essentially, like I've been like out on just figuring out everything that we. Or just like writing down everything that needs to be worked on on IPFS land, uh, and having a lot of discussions on it. Um, I have been also having a lot of discussions with Pedro, uh, who is working on PeerPath, on what needs to be done in order for PeerPath to work. Uh, what are the things that we will be able to extract from PeerPath for others to build applications on top? Um, from like methods of authentication, uh, just the CRT that's on top of IPFS that other people can use as a, just a key value store and so on. Been working on preparing the workshop. So like if someone is going to be at MozFest in the end of the month in London, um, we'll be there just like showing people how PeerPad works internally. And like we'll have like a small workshop that everyone will be able to build like a small discrete application on top of IPFS. Uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, if you are in London, make sure to, to, um, to join us. Uh, yeah, like I have a huge backlog, so many issues. Uh, I know a lot of people have pinged me <laughs> to hit up an email. I'm working as fast as I can to get to everyone. I'm sorry if you are blocked. Let me know through IRC if you're like super blocked, uh, because you need an answer for me. Um, I'll try to keep provide you with information as soon as I can. Um, trying to understand what, what are the top priority ones right now. And that's it for me. All right, if no one has questions, we have like 10 minutes left, but like we can also end the meeting here. Oh, I see a hand, Johnny. I, I have one, one, oh, oh, okay. Johnny and then Dimitri. Yeah, so just my question as far as like actually for uh, pubs, pub sub, either the room or um, what uh, David was working on is really, how do we decide what messaging we're, uh, protocol we're actually gonna do once we actually have a channel? So I think um, different applications have different needs. Uh, I, even, I even was actually thinking about reusing ActivityPub um, to actually as the to framework for communication back and forth. But mm -hmm. I think there's, there's probably some sort of need for, you know, hey, I'm, I'm talking about D, DID uh, verifiable claims back and forth, or I'm actually doing a, a distributed uh, geo um, uh, carbon marketplace and actually what what's, you know, what, what messages do you speak? Sort of actually, once you actually get into a room or a channel, there's actually a need for a protocol to actually to chat about. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, so there is multiple answers to that question because there is multiple ways to approach it. Uh, right now, IPFS pub sub room is like one of the many porcelains that we've been building on top of IPFS. And so like what we are now kind of like developing is this framework where there's a lot of innovation. Well, there's a lot of innovation in IPFS core, but there's also a lot of innovation on IPFS like kind of user land, which is like IPFS pub sub room, the, the YGS adapter and so on. Things that people are building on top of IPFS that are super useful for like a set of apps, but not necessarily things that we know that should be like primitives that people should get from IPFS. So we kind of like develop these things on top and we expose them to the like general community. And like then we kind of try to understand if they are useful or not. And like how they are useful, what are the pain points, what should we in the end push to core? Like uh, what is this innovation that is happening on user land that we should push to core that should be implemented in all of the IPFS uh, implementations in multiple languages? Um, so that is one. IPFS pops up room, yes, like you get this room that you subscribe to and uh, then like, you're just broadcasting information. But the underlying pub sub that IPFS exposes tells you that like you get messages that you subscribe on a certain topic. And, and for example, you can just publish on a topic, um, like you can just publish on a topic like IDs of peers that are interested on that, that topic. Like you don't even have to transmit the information through the PubSub channel. If you were to transmit the IDs that are interested on a certain topic, then you can dial to those nodes. 
once you dial to those nodes, the primitive that Leap Peer to Peer offers you to dial is um, actually two. Like you can dial just for the sake of dialing, and then like once you dial, you start bit swapping with a node, you start DHTing with a node. But it, you also can dial on a protocol. You can do like dot dial, uh, peer ID or peer uh, multi other, and then you can select a string which is a multi codec, and that's how bit swap and DHT works. It's like when you dial to a peer you open multiple streams over the same connection, and you say, on this stream I want to speak PubSub, on this stream I want to speak BitSwap, on this stream I want to speak DHT. And you can do that for your own protocol. You can say, oh, I want to use the same underlying connection and speak another protocol that has a specific wire format. And because it will be on its own isolated multiplex stream, like can do whatever it wants. Like You can define your own wire format. You can even have um, multiple wire formats working over the same connection. In fact, like BitSwap already, because there was a migration from IPFS 041 to two or something, that now we have BitSwap 100 and BitSwap 110. And like the IPFS node will check, will try to dial on both BitSwaps. And like if the node supports the latest, it uses the latest, and it's the one that supports IPLD nodes. Um, the, the other version is like just Merkle Dag land where you just like exchange protocols. And so it gives you this like power of future proofing your system. It gives you a way to upgrade the wire formats without necessarily having to say to the entire network, well, it's time to, to change the version. Like the, the old version is not working anymore. And, and so you could do that. If this like it was a lot of information, a lot of new terms, uh, Totally understand. We need to improve our documentation. I can like provide more clear answers if you point me at questions uh, like the same way that you just asked here through issues, and then I can like point you to all of these repos and all of these discussions and all of these notes, or even just like create new documentation uh, because it helps us a lot each time like people ask questions about how these things work that we then understand. Okay, we need to write more examples about this or more diagrams about this and so on. Um, okay. Was this helpful at all? Yeah, I'll, I'll, make an, I'll make an issue because I, I think I, I, I want to understand more. And because uh, I think there's the, the plumbing of the messaging of actually how uh, BitSwap actually works. Mm -hmm. There's actually the mode itself of actually that has structure. And I think that's where I'm at right now. I think mm -hmm. um, all you guys worry about the plumbing down here. I, I'm yeah. worried about the content. And so how do yeah. we actually like get peers talking back and forth? Actually, hey, I'm talking this protocol and um, and and how do we actually go back and forth? And, and I, actually, the way I, I implemented it ultimately was actually I had two pub sub rooms. This one was a server client. This one's client server. And basically, I'm sending encrypted stuff this way, and you're sending, and sending encrypted. This way. And that's the way I solved it. That's, that's probably the best way. To it. Yeah, yeah, that's like because pub sub room basically creates like multicast rooms where like everyone speaks to everybody all at the same time, and, and, and you want some kind of like direction uh, or even like. Bidirectional connections, but they're not necessarily like broadcast to the entire network. Um, pop -sub, the, uh, the, sorry, uh, the pop sub room, it's Dimitri. I was yeah, recently ahead. working with it as well, and so I was checking out the code, and, and you can talk to specific peer as well. So you can actually specify a peer that you want to uh, send messages back and forth. I'm not sure if that's what you guys are talking about, but if, if mm -hmm. that's what's required, then, then pop, uh, pop sub room actually supports that. Yeah, and that's through a signal server to actually define each other? Um, you can use a signal server, but once you have a connection, you can just, uh, once, you, once you know about the peer, you can just directly connect to it as well, uh, if that peer supports that. So it's just passing the peer ID uh, to, um, there's a specific method in, in uh, PubSub Room that you can pass a peer ID, and that way you'll establish a direct connection to that, to that peer ID, and you'll be able to send messages back and forth. With that and that's with and that's without a uh, signal server. Uh, signal server, I believe, it's just for discovering the nodes. Would be it, um, it is a, it, another level. Uh, if I may, sorry, Dimitri. If I may, like, think about it. Or like, you have a thing that just like establishes connections, like sockets mm -hmm. between peers. Once you do that, you upgrade the connection to a stream multiplexer, so that you can have like these multiple channels uh, for between every peer. When you reach the PubSub level, either PubSub Room or even like the IPFS PubSub, you don't think anymore 
like how you get the connection. You just think, oh, I'm connected to the peer or I can find more ways to connect to other peers. And so that can be through a WebRTC channel, that can be through a TCP socket, that can be through a web sockets. But like at that level, like the um, IP fast pops room doesn't really care. In order for it to work in the browser today, the transport that we support is WebRTC and WebSockets. And WebRTC does use a signaling server that also gives the discoverability property. So like, that's why when you open a node with WebRTC enabled, like, it just starts connecting to other nodes because it, like, all of them are connecting to this point that has information about more nodes. But what we want to upgrade is to enable IPFS nodes to be these renewable points for any other node. So I connect to a bootstrapper node of IPFS, and then I ask, hey, do you have more peers that are using WebRTC? If yes, tell me about it. Um, and so that like mm -hmm. any node in the, um, in the network can be a renewable point for any other node so that you don't have to like use a specific renewable point uh, as it is working today. Uh, it, it is part of like the, the upgrade path. We cannot just escape the fact that we really need a renewable point. Like for WebRTC, you need a, a place to exchange the signaling data, like the, the offers between peers so that they can open mm -hmm. ports in the browser. That, that's the only thing that we cannot escape. Yeah, Johnny, sure. if, you, if you want to open that issue, um, that'd be really helpful to me as well. So I'll subscribe to that um, as well. All yeah, right, cool. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, let's continue chatting through issues. Um, happy to provide a lot of more context there. Um, okay. And, and, and Dimitri, thank you also for jumping in. Sure. Cool. So we are one minute left. Any critical things? Anything? I, uh, I have one, one small thing to mention. Uh, I did run a couple of meetups here in Costa Rica and I did present IPFS and talk about IPFS to a few people, and surprisingly, a lot of people are actually aware of uh, IPFS. I guess it's not surprisingly anymore, but <laughs> a lot nice. of people are aware. They're, they're eager to start using it, and um, I'm thinking about uh, running a couple more once I have a chance, and uh, maybe maybe even uh, building a few um, something that uses IPFS. But there is will, and there people are aware, and, and they're paying close attention to what's going on here. So. That's super awesome. If there are any recordings, uh, please post them. So I will. I will check back with the organizers. Uh, they did uh, run some uh, live streaming, and I believe they might have the recordings as well. So I'll, I'll check with them, and, and we may be able to publish them. They were in Spanish, so <laughs> that's great. But that's great. I guess you need more content in other languages. Yep, yeah, it'll probably help the uh, the Spanish speaking community. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, if you could, I, I know that there's an issue for that meetup on the Access community. If you could post the links there. Yep. I will. I will uh, contact Pelopio and ask him for the recordings because he's uh, one of the organizers and he should have them. I believe. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So I guess that ends our meeting. Maybe. Oh wait. To be sorry, this is Jay. Uh, Do you mind uh, putting the link to the uh, New Orleans workshop that you're going to be involved with? Uh, uh, oh, sorry, I, I probably um, miscommunicated. Uh, I meant London. It's called Moss Fest. Oh, it's the Mozilla Festival, but it's London. Okay. Sorry, my pronunciation. will appreciate the link. To yeah, I'll, I'll do. I'll do. Uh, Moss Fest. So I just put the, the link to the festival. I'll check if they already have uploaded a reference to the workshop. All right, so this is it. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, see you all next week or in some other meeting during this time, this week. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the week and yeah, see everyone online on IRC and get a wishes. All right, take care everyone. Bye. Have a good week. Bye.